Dear, dear Father, at this moment in time, I pray that you come and you mingle with us, Lord, that you send the Holy Spirit to be with us, Lord. Lord, we know that you want to give us the Holy Spirit more than parents want to give gifts to their kids, Lord. So, Lord, I pray that you allow it to permeate within our hearts, Lord. Allow us to hear a message from you, O oh Lord. Allow us to be touched and allow us to go, allow us to go home different than when we came. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I love watching movies. I love watching movies. And um, the last movie I actually watched was The Life of Pi. I don't know if any of you guys have seen that movie, but it's actually quite, a, quite an interesting movie. And when I watch a movie, I like to be edified by the movie. I like to gain a message from it. And this, this movie was about an um, a Indian boy. He, his dad was the zookeeper. So he gained an affinity with the animals. He, he talked to the animals. He had a relationship with these animals. And as he grew older, his dad decided that they wanted to move their zoo from India to Canada. So his parents, his brother, they all decided that they wanted to move. And you can't really fly all those animals from India to Canada. You have to take a boat. And his dad told him, in case something happens, what I want you to do is I want you to know if this boat capsizes, you need to take the sparkler gun and you need to jump off the boat, get onto a, a rescue raft, and what I want you to do is fire this, this sparkler into the air. And any boats in the neighboring vicinity will see this and they will come to your rescue. So he didn't really think much about it. He thought, that's never going to happen anyway. So he continued on his journey and they, they embarked on his journey and they, they were about three weeks into the voyage. And one night he just woke up miraculously. He woke up miraculously and it was in the middle of a thunderstorm. He woke up in the middle of the thunderstorm and for some strange reason, he decided that he wanted to actually go on deck. He goes on deck in the middle of this thunderstorm. This ends up being his saving grace and the buoyancy of the ship actually gets a little bit off and the ship capsizes. He manages to get onto an escape raft and he manages to save some of the animals. But everyone else on that boat lost their lives, including his parents. And you can imagine he was distraught, you know, he was full of despair, he crying, he was full of anguish. He was on this boat now and then he remembered what his dad had told him. His dad had told him, if you are ever lost, take hold of this sparkler. And when there are ships in the neighboring vicinity, shoot this in the air. When you shoot this in the air, they will come to your rescue. And so he held on to this promise. He held on to this promise and he, he based his whole life around that. And for the next couple of days, you know, he started talking to the animals because, you know, when you're at sea for such a long time, you need to maintain your sanity. He started talking to them and he started fishing. He started actually fishing for himself. He started fishing for the animals as well. Then one day he looked onto the horizon and he saw what looks like a ship. Now, he wasn't sure whether the ship was a hallucination or if it was for real because when you're at sea for such a long time, you tend to see things. He looked a little bit closer and he realized that this ship was actually a ship and he couldn't maintain his joy. He, he decided to take the sparkler and what did he do? He shot it up into the air. He waited with bated breath. He's waiting for this, this ship to come to him and he's waiting, he's waiting. He waits and he realizes that the ship isn't coming any closer. If anything, the ship is actually getting further away. And so he shoots the sparkler up again. The ship soon disappears on the horizon. Can you imagine his anguish? He just lost all his parents. He's just lost, you know, everything. And he was told, if you throw up this sparkler, you will be rescued. Brothers and sisters, today I want to submit to you that Sometimes we pray to God and sometimes it seems like he doesn't answer our prayers. Sometimes, you know, we might be going through tough times. We might be ill. We might not be too, doing too well. Sometimes we might seem like, you know, nothing is, is happening. Sometimes we just want a break in life and nothing's coming through. And we're praying to God because we're told that God will come through for us. But sometimes God stays silent. What do you choose to do in times like this? Turn with me to Matthew 15. Verses, 50, verses 21 to 23. 
Matthew 15, verses 21 to 23. Say amen when you find it, church. I read in your hearing. And Jesus went out thence and withdrew it into the parts of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a Canaanite woman came out from these borders and cried, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with a demon. But he answered her, Not a word. My daughter is grievously vexed with a demon. But he answered her, Not a word. So, just a little bit of context. This woman's a Canaanite woman and she's come to Jesus. She's heard about his miracles. She's heard what he's done. Even in the previous chapter, he just fed the 5,000. So if he so chose, if he, so chose he could have actually healed his, her daughter right there and then. So why did he not? Why did he not? This really bothers me because sometimes I've prayed to God. You know, I haven't been feeling too well sometimes and I pray to God, I ask him to deliver me from these afflictions, but he doesn't do anything. And so I decided I was going to study precept upon precept. I decided I was going to go further into this and find out what was actually going on. And in the previous chapter, I realized that Jesus was in Genesaret. And at the end of chapter 15, I realized that he was trying to get to Galilee. But what he does at the beginning of chapter 15 is he goes to Tyre and Sidon. Now, Tyre and Sidon has, is a city full of history, a city full of history. It was a fishing port. It was also a, a trading area as well. And, he, and any great kingdom which wanted to overtake you know, that region decided that they wanted Tyre and Sidon because it was a strategically sought-after place. So King Nebuchadnezzar, the great King Nebuchadnezzar, he actually, he actually decided that he was going to try to overtake Tyre and Sidon, but the Tyre and Sidon people were resilient people. And he besieged the city for 13 years. So what that means is that he surrounded the city for 13 years. But they were so resilient that they never gave up. 250 years later, Alexander the Great, the great Alexander the Great, decided that he was going to do what no one else had done and overtake Tyre and Sidon. Now, Alexander the Great was no mere man. By the age of 20, he had actually overtaken his father's kingdom. And by the age of 30, he had actually taken over more than half the world. A little side note to us as, as, as young people and as people in general, we need to reach for the stars. You know, we need to dream big. Just as long as it's in line with God's word, we need to dream big and go for it. And the thing about it is Alexander the Great overtakes this, this city and what you find is that when, when a city is overtaken by so many different people, after a while, they start to forget who they are. So, when so many different religions come into this place, what you find that is, after a while, they tend to believe nothing. So it's like this country, there's so many Muslims and Christians around and Buddhists. But the fastest growing religion is actually atheism. And in Tyre and Sidon, there was actually a, a spiritual void. No one actually believed anything. So, I was kind of confused. I was asking myself, why did Jesus go to Tyre and Sidon? If he really wanted to evangelize, he would go to Galilee. It's like me saying, okay, I'm trying to get to the Caribbean from London. Why am I going to go to the North Pole first? I'm going to go straight to the Caribbean. But Jesus went to Tyre and Sidon. And then it hit me. Jesus was staying silent with the woman, not because he didn't care, because he'd actually made an appointment with that woman long before she knew that he was on his way. Long before, he, long before she knew that she needed his help, he was already on his way to her. Isaiah 65, 24 tells us, before you call me, I will answer. And while you're yet speaking, I will hear. So oftentimes we feel like God isn't answering our prayers. But God knows us. He knows what we're going through. He knows our issues and he cares. So if he is staying silent, it is not because he doesn't care. He's staying silent for a reason. And sometimes the reason is he's trying to test our faith. You see, how do you know how strong your faith is? How do you really know how strong your faith is? 
when it's tested. If God answered your prayers every single time, that really requires no faith at all. It requires no faith at all. Hard times teach us lessons that good times could never teach us. That's the truth. That's the truth right there. Recently, my friend, um, he got the flu vaccine, or the flu jab. And the whole premise of a flu jab is that, <laughs> the whole premise is that the doctor gives you the flu so you don't catch the flu in the long run. Do you understand? So the thing is, God knows that there are going to be some hard times to come. And so he allows us to go through a little bit of hard times now so that our immunity increases and so that we can actually get through the hard times to come. And so we need to count it all joy when we go through diverse temptations and trials and tribulations. It's actually for our benefit. And so I continue. Matthew 15, 24 to 25. She's asked Jesus for help, and he stayed silent. And in Matthew 15, 24 to 25, it says, She came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. Now, I don't know about you, but if someone's aired me one time, I'm not trying again. Straight, I'm not trying again. But this woman is resilient. She's resilient. She keeps trying. And not only does she try, she praises God despite her situation. There's something about praising God despite your situation, despite what is going on around you. There's something about it. It elicits a reaction from God. It's like a battle cry. The Bible tells us, when the enemy comes in like a flood, I will raise up a standard against him. Let me just give you a little bit of context. In, in the medieval um, age, when there was a war and someone became isolated, you know, the enemy was coming around them and, and, and they were threatening to kill them. That person would cry out for help. And what would happen is the king would raise a flag and, and all of the army would actually galvanize around this one individual and, and, and drive back the enemy. And that is what God is doing. When we praise God, he drives back the enemy all the time. You know, sometimes the enemy comes in like a flood. I find it really um, interesting imagery that in Isaiah, he chooses to, to say the enemy comes in like a flood because that's exactly what he does. It's like a tsunami. When the devil comes at you, he comes at you from different angles and he comes at you all at one time. So you might be finding it difficult to pay your bills. Then you might find that your, your, your partner is just acting up or you might find that you, do you know what I mean? You, you might lose your job. It, it all happens all at one point, but we need to hold on. We need to praise God despite our situations. And in verse 26 to 28, he says, And he answered and said, It is not meat to take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. But she said, Yea, Lord, for even the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman of great faith, be it done unto thee, even as thou will. And her daughter was healed from that hour. <laughs> this, this is powerful stuff. I've learned so many things from just that little passage. Now, when I was, um, I was in the Caribbean, actually, this, this summer, and it was, it was lovely. Um, my family and I, we would just chill in the kitchen, and we would just have breakfast together. We'd have mangoes and, and um, breadfruit, bread, and we'd leave the door open. And when we left the door open, like the the dogs would come in and the cats and stuff. And we were so spoilt for food that actually sometimes we didn't even want to eat. And what we did was sometimes we'd throw the food to the, to the animals. And they, left, they ate our leftovers like it was Christmas. They ate it like it was, you know, just... <laughs> they, they, they lapped it up. And it actually to, it showed me that us in church, we have been brought up on the word from the time we were young. We, we've listened to it day in, day out. And after a while, we become indifferent to it. Sometimes we can't even be bothered. But there are people out there, if they were just to hear a snippet of what we've heard, oh man, they would hold on to that. They would hold on to that and their faith would be so strong. This passage also teaches me about intercessory prayer. What I find amazing is that 
The person who was actually afflicted was the girl. But she never met Jesus, you know. She never met Jesus. It was her mum's faith which healed her. And that's, that's crazy because when I actually think about it, I've gone through times where, you know, I didn't know how I was going to get through. Sometimes I'd have my sleepless nights and I'll just be, you know, tossing and turning. Then I'll hear someone praying and I'll turn and I'll realize it's my mum who's praying for me. You know, and I know I would not be here if it was not for my mother's prayers. I know that. There are times when, you know, I'm, I was at uni like three years ago and I just felt like giving up. I just felt like this, I can't take this anymore. Then my mum would just call me at that exact moment and be like, look, the Holy Spirit's told me that I need to holler at you right now. And she'll pray for me right there and then. It's very important that we pray for each other. Very important. If you say you love someone, pray for them. That's the truest form of love. Pray for them. What I've also learned is that we need to be resilient. We need to be resilient. Sometimes when we pray for things, God doesn't always answer. But does that mean that we stop praying? No, we continue praising him. And then we pray some more. We keep praying. I was reading this, um, this little extract from, from Sister White's book, Christian Service. And it really spoke to me. I'll read it out to you guys. Be patient, Christian children. Yet a little while. And he that shall come will come. The night of weary waiting and watching and mourning is nearly over. The reward will soon be given. The eternal day will soon dawn. There is no time to sleep now. No time to indulge in useless regret. He who ventures to slumber now will miss precious opportunities of doing good. We are granted that blessed privilege of gathering sheaves in the great harvest. Who is eager to lay off the armor when by pushing the battle a little longer, he will achieve new victories and gather new trophies for eternity. Brothers and sisters, whatever you're going through right now, you are so close to a breakthrough. You are so close, you just need to break through. The reason why it's called a breakthrough is because you're supposed to break through into the presence of God. And a breakthrough is never easy. But you've got to keep going, you've got to keep trying. I'm not really, um, I'm not really one for testimonies and stuff like that. I don't really like to talk about my, my business, but <laughs> the truth of the matter is, God has been too good for me, man. Good to, too good to me. Too good to me. And he's given me too many breakthroughs. I've got to, I've got to tell you guys. Um, I was raised in the church, as you know. Some of you guys remember me from when I was a little child. And I've always known what was right and what was wrong. I've always known. Um... I reached about 14, 15, and I got involved in, in sexual sin. I thought it was cool at the time. I thought that's what people do, you know, that's what men do, right? And I kept on doing what I was doing. It was fun, it was exciting, all those kind of stuff. And um, I reached about 17, 18, and I met this, this young lady. And one thing led to another, and she got pregnant. Um, thank God for our brothers, you know. Thank God for Craig, you know, because the only reason I'm telling you this now is because of his testimony on, on Monday. Um, she got pregnant, and I, and I wish I could say I was strong enough to to do the right thing and, and say we're going to work this out, but I wasn't. I was, I was, I was weak. And um, the decision was made not to, to keep the baby. And it was, it, was, it was hard because I remember that, that same week actually, that same week, Shannon had actually asked me to come and preach. The same week, you know. And it just shows you never really know what people are going through. You never really know. And I, I prayed to God. I prayed to God and I said, Lord, forgive me like, for what's just happened. 
But the scariest thing is, I never felt good. I felt alone. I don't know what hell feels like, but hell is the absence of God, and that's what I felt. I felt a darkness. I felt overwhelmed. And I, and I, couldn't, I couldn't take it any longer. So I said, you know what, forget this God thing. I'm, I'm done. I'd come to church just to you know, make my mom happy because moms don't like it when you don't come to church. <laughs> Came to church and then I, I kind of kept on going on the way I was going. Um, went out with my friends. We used to go clubbing and stuff like that and meet girls and, you know, we just kept on going, kept on going. I fell into pornography as well. And after a while, I realized it started messing with my mind. So when it was time for me to actually get into a relationship, I, I couldn't love. These people were expecting love from me, but I didn't even love myself, so how could I love them? And I reached, a, I reached a point, I reached a crossroads. I was like, Lord, I can't do this anymore. I need you to come through for me. I need a breakthrough. I need you to come through right now. And I prayed and I prayed and you know, I pluck up the courage to, to stay strong for two weeks and then after the two weeks, I'd, I'd slip up and I'd fall back into my sin. And there'll be times when I'll just, you know, bust a little tear. I'll be like, Lord, I've heard that you come through. I've heard that you can bring fire down from heaven, like for Elijah and stuff like that. So why are you not coming through for me? And I prayed and I prayed and I prayed. And then I got my brothers to pray for me. I got my, peop I got my people to pray for me. The Bible tells us, confess your sins one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. And so I prayed prayed and I prayed and as of 2016 I've been free from sexual sin now to some of you that might not sound like a lot but to me someone that you know every one or two weeks I couldn't go without that's that's a miracle that's a miracle and I've seen God work and I know that in our lives we are going through some tough times and we need a breakthrough we need a breakthrough. It might be a depression, it might be anxiety, it might be loads of different kind of things. Whatever it is, we need a breakthrough. And to break through into God's presence, you need to be resilient. You need to be resilient. And I just want to say a prayer for, for anyone who's going through such tough times now. I want to say a prayer for anyone who's, who needs a breakthrough. I want to ask that you stand where you are and I will pray for you. If you need a breakthrough in something today, stand where you are and I will pray for you. If like the woman, you know someone who needs a breakthrough but he's not here, practice intercessory prayer and get up where you are and I will pray for them too. God does not want us to be afflicted with, with all of these things. He does not want us to be tied down. He wants to break us free. But to break free, we need to come to him. Our eyes are closed, our heads are bowed. Dear Father, you said, dear Lord, you did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind, dear Lord. Lord, you said who the sun sets free is free indeed, Lord. It's Lord, at this moment in time, I'm praying that you break these people free from whatever they're going through, Lord. It could be depression. It could be suicidal thoughts, Lord. It can be addiction of any form, Lord. Just break us free, Lord. Bring down these strongholds, O oh Lord. Break these shackles, Lord. Break these chains once and for all, dear Lord. Lord, we know that you can do it, Lord. Really and truly, it's just about faith, dear Lord. In the Bible, we see the common theme. You've always said that by your faith, you are healed, Lord. So let us have faith, O oh Lord. Give us faith like a mustard seed so that we can believe that we are healed, dear Lord. Lord, I want to thank you for this campaign, Lord. It's, 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 it's changed lives. It's been unprecedented. I've never seen anything like this in Chiswick, dear Lord. And dear Lord, I pray that you continue to work through, through, through all of us, dear Lord. Don't allow your work to stop here, dear Lord. But allow it to continue past these two weeks, dear Lord. 
Allow us to bring souls to you, dear Lord. And allow us to all get to the kingdom. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please praise the Lord.